I want to speak today on a message that I will title it a holy hangover. We will finish the series on anointing where we want to talk about what happens after great mountaintop experiences. When people sometimes have great moments with God and then after those great moments with God they tend to hit this valleys or they tend to hit this emotional emotional vacuum emotional low from emotional high to emotional low for those of us who've been in the world before or who um, have consumed alcohol and before you gotten saved or maybe even after you got saved and you still struggled with that you know that in the world they have this thing called the hangover the hangover is these sim the symptoms is when you get a headache next day you start throwing up you feel dizzy because you've consumed too much of alcohol it means you had too much fun the night before and next morning you're trying to recover now excuse me if that is offensive to some of you to compare that to a spiritual terms but I do believe sometimes when we hit this emotional highs with God whether it happens on the service whether it happens on the conference or it happens at some kind of a retreat or it happens at the internship or maybe you get away for something and you experience this you fast for a week or fast for a few days and you experience these emotional highs and these things that you feel so great and you feel like this will never end many times every single person understands we have to come down from this kind of experience to a real normal mundane life. Amen. When disciples went to the mountain with Jesus and the Bible says his face was transfigured and his clothes were shining and this is what Peter says say master can we build three tents here so that we can stay here see it's always our desire when we hit an emotional high to say God I want to stay there. I believe the reason why many people are addicted to drugs is because our generation is not addicted to drugs we're addicted to a high and even when we get to church you know we experience the high we say that you know there's no high like the most high you know we feel the Holy Spirit we feel the presence of God but the Bible says a righteous man doesn't live by his high he lives by his faith and when Jesus's face stopped shining he still was powerful I want you to know something even when the face of Jesus does not shine Jesus is still reliable see when you experience a mountaintop experience everything comes alive the Word of God becomes alive Jesus becomes alive there is something special about Jesus now Jesus is always special but in our heart in our emotions many times it kind of seems like a mundane Jesus like an everyday Jesus but it's everyday Jesus that raised Lazarus from the dead it's his clothes when they were not shining that they healed a woman with an issue of blood it's this Jesus whose face wasn't shining he came and a demon possessed boy he rebuked a demon and the Bible says the boy was restored your everyday Jesus is very powerful and he doesn't need to shine to be great can somebody say amen can somebody say hallelujah I want to encourage each person today to learn how to enjoy the highs and not to stay in the lows I want us to learn how to enjoy the mountaintops because the reality of life is this. The paradox of life is this. You experience seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And it's not a curse. Sometimes that's the reality. You experience this thing where you got enough fire to wait for the bridegroom and he comes late because his watch probably was broken and you don't have enough fire because now you only had fire for him to come on time but one thing with God is that God is always on his time not ours that means you always have a have to have a stamina and have enough extra when God doesn't come on time when things don't go your way and when things when you don't emotionally feel good to still life is a roller coaster you have to sometimes sit tight buckle up and enjoy the ride hallelujah Jesus is powerful even when he doesn't shine it's not just the Monday mornings that I'm referring to right now it's the seasons in life where we go from great highs to seems like great lows sometimes when we experience healings through us 
and then we experience just weeks where we cannot get one person healed saved and in that moment this is where the enemy works over time to try to wipe us out sometimes our spiritual batteries begin to kind of die out and today what I want to do is I want to just share with you three things that will really help from the scripture of how to get over a hangover a holy hangover I'm gonna look at the prophet's life who I believe is one of the greatest prophet in the history of the world and of the Old Testament his name is Elijah Elijah had an experience Elijah was a brutal prophet a ruthless prophet he came to the one of the worst time that Israel has ever had Elijah came to a season where an Israel was ran by a witch who didn't worship God and who had prophets of Baal he she literally had witch doctors and witches on the payroll of the government she had so many of them they brought the whole demonic demons ruled the Israel during her reign she was so powerful full of demons that prophets of God couldn't stand she killed prophets for living and Elijah decided to mess with her he saw the Israel was so numb to the witchcraft and to the soul numb being desensitized by by her spells that he wanted to wake her wake them up and the way he woke them up he just simply opened his mouth and he said guys there will be no rain because I said it and then he asked God to help him find food so God had ravens deliver him some some meat every morning and every evening and water and after three or something years or after some time that the brook dries up ravens died probably God sends him to the widow and Elisha survives through the widow and Elisha literally put himself in this situation to wake people up and then God tells Elisha I want you to go show yourself to Ahab and I will send the rain I want you to see something God does not tell Elisha to do a showdown on Mount Carmel God says just show up and I'll bring the rain Elisha doesn't want to just show up Elijah comes to Ahab and he said listen bring all of the witch doctors on this mountain and we're gonna do a contest God didn't ask him to do a contest but see when you're on fire for God you go beyond what God asks you to do you're like Jesus I want to glorify your name at whatever cost it takes now you have to understand a witch doctor would have never agreed to gather in front of a country that already accepts them to prove themselves unworthy of the challenge that means these guys and historically it's proven have had success in bringing fire from heaven on whatever object they wanted to see they wouldn't meet with Elisha if they had no experience in this the first miracle happens with Elisha is when he neutralized their power he, they lost the reception with the demonic kingdom and they were cutting themselves the Bible says dancing and prophesying but there was no one who answered why because Elisha neutralized their frequency and they couldn't bring the fire and Elisha the Bible says that he pours water on the altar and something great happens God's fire comes and doesn't just show it consumes even water and everything and everyone gets on their knees and says the Lord is God the Lord is God Elisha uses the momentum takes the soldiers takes all the witch doctors and kills them talk about revival Ahab stands there says well new God came into town let's follow new God Elisha tells Ahab get on your chariot go and there's gonna be rain now remember God says he'll send the rain there is still no rain Elisha goes on a mountain prays for seven times God sends a cloud the rain begins to come and it seems like finally I have had a breakthrough there was one person one person who reigned on Elisha's parade have you had everything go great and one comment or one person one thing at a job just one thing and that one thing starts a domino effect of everything starts going wrong okay it never happens to us maybe we're not anointed as Elisha but it happens to every one of us the Bible says the next day he gets an email from Jezebel and Je Jezebel says and she delivered it probably through post office or UPS certified sign this says this uh, in one day I will kill you now if Jezebel really wanted to kill him she wouldn't send a messenger she would have sent an assassin she's good at killing we know that 
her resume is full of people that she killed but she wasn't interested in killing Elijah she wanted to scare Elijah and she did it so good because you see a guy who literally could close heaven stand against hundreds of witch doctors and bring fire down raise the dead a guy that people were scared of a guy who holy spirit could take in one place and secretly place into another place and nobody will know where he's at a guy who had ravens ravens don't even give food to their children and they share their food with him a guy who walked in such a great power got scared because of a message not she didn't punch him she didn't hit him she didn't inject him she only sent him a message to kill him and the bible says he started to run he became so discouraged that a scripture says he did not want to live the revival was quickly forgotten the fire was forgotten the ravens the brook everything was forgotten and Elisha prays this prayer he says Lord take my life I'm done I don't want to do anything I'm tired of this people are never gonna change no matter how many miracles we bring they still do their thing it's never enough everybody's dead I'm alone I am done and Elijah has a hangover he's sick he's emotionally destroyed and he literally already has a headache from all of this that's been happening and I want you to see three things that happened to Elijah that could help us when we have an emotional hangover first of all is Elijah goes to God and I would say that it's a presence of God Elijah goes to God he runs to the mountain where God met Moses he runs to the mountain where God made, met Israel before the first thing we all must do is we have to go to God if you can't go to God drag yourself to God if you can't drag yourself to God crawl to God if you can't crawl to God find four friends that can bring you to God but don't stay where you're staying The problem, the problem happens with us is this, is that we stay in the place where we got the bad message or the bad news. We cook it, we rehearse it, we, we just review it and what Elijah started to do, he I think walked 120 miles and then he left his servant and walked for, a, for 200 miles to get to the mountain where God was. One of the things that I personally like to do is when things, when I feel like a bottom falls from under my foot and just emotionally I am not with where I'm at, I go to two places mentally. First place is where God visited me and I felt like God met me personally and revealed himself to me. It happened upstairs in the office at 12 during a Wednesday when I was in high school. I was fasting. I skipped that day and I went to fast upstairs. I go literally to that place and I stand there and I say, God, I feel like you left me. But last time we were here and you called me in this place. The second place that I like to go is to the Winko parking lot where I felt like God gave me a vision for the ministry. I park my car there and I say, God, I felt like you called that 16 year old boy. And I am that boy today sitting here and saying, God, if you brought me to this, I believe you'll bring me through it, but I need your help. Something happens emotionally when you go back to the place where you got saved. When you go back to the place where you met God, you recharge your energies and your memories begin to just be stimulated with those feelings. Not with the feelings of discouragement, but the feelings where you met God. You will begin to feel God. Can somebody say amen? One of the reasons we have to go to God is because the devil will use our success to lower our identity to the level of our success if he succeeds in lowering your identity to the level of your success now at first nothing wrong with that you feel great when you begin to look at yourself and you look at your business you look at your family you look at your kids and you see you know what they're doing great and you look at yourself and you say you know what everything is good but it's a trap because the second step is this he will use a mistake, a failure, 
a problem put a magnifying glass on it and says that is who you are if he can get you to get the good things to define you it's only a trap on this path where he will use the bad things to refine you he will put a magnifying glass on a small little word from a witch and say listen this is who you are and then everything good that God did begins to lose its appeal why because who you are comes from whose you are not what you've done and not what you have accomplished can somebody say amen somebody give God a shout of praise because you belong to Jesus you belong to the Holy Spirit you were washed by the blood of God Holy Spirit lives in you. Can somebody say amen? amen? I am who God says I am. Good things in life don't make me who I am. The love of God makes me who I am. I want you to remember this for the rest of your life. You are always greater than your greatest success. Because you were worth dying for. You were worth sending angels to be your bodyguards you were worth Holy Spirit not taking residence in the royal palace in England but royal palace inside of your body you have a citizenship in heaven you might not have an American passport but you have the greatest passports of all passports you have a passport that will pass through eternity the passport of heaven you have your name written in the Lamb's book of life when you allow success to determine who you are the devil got you on the trap and because of what happened at Carmel, Elijah felt great. But see, that is a trap. The compliments of people, if they go into your head, the criticism of people will go straight into your heart. At first your head gets swollen and then your heart gets broken because it's the devil's trap. Your identity is not linked to what people say about you, even to what circumstances say about you. Maybe your family fell apart. Maybe your health is falling apart. That is not who you are you are a spirit you are loved by God and your relationship with God is not just for what God can do through you your relationship with God is because God is madly in love with you and that's why when things fall apart we go back to God and say God this is all I have I have you you are my everything God you loved me when I had ministry and you loved me in my mother's womb when I was the most defenseless being on this earth you loved me and you called me before any of my days were on this earth and God you are my source. I build my house on the rock not on a sinking sand. My friends when things get tough, when things get rough or when things get good don't let them define who you are. Compliments from people are like a gum. You chew it and you spit it away. What God says about you is a bread. It feeds you. When John the Baptist had the greatest revival, the Bible says, and I know it's a general statement, the whole Judea came to John the Baptist. People were getting saved. Romans were getting saved. People were getting baptized. He was on the peak. He was on the Time magazine. Like in our days speaking, literally this guy had the most followers. He was the top dog of that day. I mean literally God just moving. Jesus got baptized in John the Baptist ministry. This is how great it was. And at the peak of that they came to him and they said, John, who are you? Are you Christ? He said, no. Are you Elijah? No. Are you one of the prophets? No. Are you a successful preacher? No. Who are you? And he said, I am who prophet Isaiah said I am. Means he said, I am not defined by the crowds that I attract. I am defined by what God says many, many, many years ago about me. In a few months, John the Baptist went from powerful preacher to the powerful prisoner. And start going through his emotional withdrawals. And Jesus said this about John. He says, you know that John is still the greatest prophet ever born to a woman up to now. Why? Because when you anchor who you, who you are in Christ, whether you're on the top or on the bottom, you remain in Christ. Herod can take your head off but he cannot take your identity. He can take away your ministry but he cannot take the grace and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit.
Potiphar's wife can blackmail you and she can destroy your resume and your reputation but she cannot take the presence of the Holy Spirit from your life. Your critics can tarnish your reputation but they cannot tarnish your love and God's love for you. Can somebody say amen? Can somebody say hallelujah? Can we take a moment and give God praise for always being with us, for always being on our side, for never abandoning us, for never siding with our critics. Come on somebody, give God a shout of praise. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Thank you Jesus. Thank you Jesus. We may take our seats. Hallelujah. When things go down, we go to God and we remind ourselves who we are is in God. Period. You can write this in your notes. Is that the noise of the world gets silenced in the whispers of God. The power of God stirs you. The presence of God stills you. The power of God changes our actions. The presence of God changes our hearts. The power of God, it changes our, it changes what we do but the presence of God causes us to be. And many of us when we live only in the power of God instead of the presence of God, we live on this high but it's the whispers of God. When they come, they neutralize everything that people say. They neutralize what the circumstances say. Maybe people are talking about you. All of that literally loses its appeal. Why? Because you feel the small still voice of God that says, I love you. It says whatever you've been through, whatever people think, you don't have to explain it. You just trust me because I got you in the palm of my hand and that will keep you and get you through. Can somebody say amen? amen. It got through Elijah and it will get you through as well in Jesus name. The second thing that happened to Elisha and this is gonna, I'm gonna go through this very quick, is that Elisha, God physically strengthened Elijah and the second thing that needs to happen and this might seem very shocking to some people here. It's your physical health. I want us to read this verse and it says the following. Chapter 19 verse 5. And as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. He looked and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drunk and lied down. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. He rose and ate and drunk and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb the mountain of God. Not only Elijah was in a spiritual battle, he was also in a physical fatigue. It puzzles me that God's angel did not give him a scripture but some burritos, some tacos, a little soda probably, sanctified and tell him go back to sleep. Elijah slept it off, woke up, he gave him some more food and drink and told him go back to sleep. Sometimes the best thing you can do on your worst day is take a nap. I want you, I'm, this, some of us will say, oh, this is, this is demons we're dealing. Well, what are you talking nap? Jesus on the worst time when he was in a boat going into the land where had thousands of demons and the Bible says disciples were all night working, 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 worked up and Jesus slept. Because he had so much peace that he could sleep in the storm, he was the only one able to stop the storm because you can only give what you have. You can't speak peace if it's inside of you a storm and one of the best ways you find peace is if you take a nap. If Jesus nap, so should you. This topic is very interesting to me, so please hang in just for a minute. I'm going to tell you about famous nappers. President John F. Kennedy ate his lunch in bed and then settled in for a nap every day. Oil industrious John Rockefeller napped every afternoon in his office. The richest man in America who was is gone already. Leonardo da Vinci took multiple naps a day and slept less at night. French Emperor Napoleon was not shy about taking his naps. He indulged in them daily. Thomas Edison was very embarrassed to admit he took 
he took naps but he practiced this ritual daily. Winston Churchill afternoon nap was non-negotiable. He believed it helped him to get twice as much done each day. President Ronald Reagan famously took naps as well and was criticized for it. Quickly I want you to write down the five things that will happen if you take this spiritual exercise. One, it will, it will restore your alertness. A National Sleep Foundation recommends a short nap of 20 to 30 minutes for improved alertness and performance without leaving you feeling droggy or interfering with the night time sleep. Nap prevents burnout. Taking a nap is like a system reboot. It, it relieves stress and gives you a fresh start. A nap heightens your sensory reception. According to Sandra Medrick, an author of Take a Nap and Change Your Life, napping can restore a, sens a sensitivity of sight, hearing and taste. Napping can improve your creativity by relaxing your mind and allowing new associations to form in it. A nap reduces a risk of heart disease. Listen to this very carefully. Did you know that those who take a midday nap at least three times a week are 37 percent less likely to die of a heart disease. Working men are 64 percent less likely if they take a nap. It's true. According to 2007 study published in archives of internal medicine, a guy from Harvard school he said who led a study he said taking a nap can turn out to be the most important weapon in fight against mortality. And last one is the nap makes you more productive. I want you to see something here. You might just skip through this but Elisha wasn't suicidal just because as Jezebel was on his case. He hasn't been sleeping well. He hasn't been eating well and physically no matter how spiritual you are. Remember this, you can only go spiritually as far as your physical body will take you. Your physical body has more effect on your emotions than even your spiritual life. And if your physical body is constantly ignored, you drink coffee at night, watch stuff at night, you get a little bit of sleep, you don't discipline yourself, you don't exercise, you don't drink water. Next thing that happens is that you can rebuke Jezebel until you lose your voice. But you need to learn how to do what angel gave Elisha. You need to learn to take naps. Some of us need to sleep less and take more naps. And we feel more alert, we feel more alive and we feel better. See God did not want our day to begin with coffee. In the beginning the Bible says a day begun with a night. That means a rest is what begins your day not coffee. If you don't get a good rest a coffee cannot replace that. Coffee can substitute for a little bit but at the end of the day if your life is constantly ignoring and damaging your physical body you will pay for it spiritually. The spiritual fight will feel more stronger than natural. I practice this a lot. When I feel that just for two hours or an hour and a half we're praying here and I'm just praying and I cannot break through. There were times I just go upstairs for 20 minutes set up my clock, knock out. I wake up and literally I feel like God came into the room. You feel so much better. You feel so much stronger. You go back into prayer and then in five minutes you just feel, just feel completely different and there is nothing wrong with that. Why? Because this is how we are wired. Our physical body affects our emotions. Can somebody say amen? And I want you to write down the last thing is that Elisha received three new assignments or purpose for his life. Not only Elisha, he got physically restored because he took a nap twice and he ate angels food. But Elisha heard God, God encouraged him, God strengthened him and we see that after God strengthened him, God gives Elisha three assignments. What I love about our God, he never rebuked Elisha. For being discouraged. If I would have been God, I would say, pull yourself together boy. You just brought fire. You just had people bow to the name of God. You're just such a great prophet. Why are you crying over here? Stop this self-pity party. Get yourself together. Get out of here. Go do something more for Jesus. But God gently comforts him and says, Elisha, I want you guys to see this. You've been focused on the nation and that's good. You have a global vision, good, but you don't have a legacy because you didn't raise a generation. And God gives him instructions and I want you to see this very carefully. God does not tell Elijah to have crusades or even miracles. God tells him to anoint three ordinary guys. Elisha instead of him, 
Jehu and one more guy and if you study Bible you find out that Elijah only did one assignment he only raised Elisha he didn't even anoint Jehu and didn't even take care of the other guy but because he anointed Elisha raised one guy see he did crusades all his life he went against the kings he was trying to change the revolution in a country but God says Elisha you have to have a global vision and you've done it great but you have to have a practical local strategy and the local strategy is you have to raise next generation so now stop with the crusades raise one man so when you die your work can continue and it so happens that the guy he raised was so much more powerful than Elijah and the guy that he raised Jehu took care of the Jezebel and ended the dynasty of witchcraft it's not just the global vision which we have to have it's a local strategy write this down we think global but we act local if we act local without thinking global we get discouraged but if we think global and we don't do anything local we will also hit a roadblock I love what Andy Stanley said your greatest impact in the world may not be the impact you make on the world but who you raise the greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something you do but someone you raise I love this about our church because I believe that our church beautifully exemplifies this because not only we have a vision for the nations we have a vision for the world but our pastor knows that this vision is not something we pray about we have to practically begin to position young people all people to begin to be a local strategy for that vision to come to pass and we are thankful for that can somebody say amen and in this message I just want to take a moment and honor our pastor and thank him for that not just the vision they're giving to us but also giving us that local strategy of using us of raising us up giving us that vision locally for us to be those Elishas who will continue that vision even when our pastor will be long gone amen let's honor our pastor for that and I want to bless him as well thank you so much for that thank you and your wife thank you amen church we may take our seats I want you to see right now this is not just about what we do globally but it's also what we do locally if you want your spiritual life to go to another level you don't need to do less you need to be more focused in what you're doing stop doing something can get you into depression you were not created to do nothing you were just created to do one thing and for Elijah it was to raise Elisha right now as we are coming to a time you know this is my motto this is my kind of thesis how I live I want to do for one what I would wish to do for everyone Jesus impacted masses but he discipled only few Jesus impacted the world but he only discipled few people we will as a, as a church we will pray for masses we'll see million people come to know the Lord and everything but at the same time the way we make the most impact is at the same at the same time we have to be the people who will take few people under our wing and begin to pour into them and then our spiritual life begins to reboot again reboot again can somebody say amen the vision that we're coming to and this is what I want to make this message very practical when the summer ends our internship ends we want to take a moment and we want to release 70 host groups what is host groups host groups is when average people who come to church excuse me businessmen stay home moms uh, people who maybe work in the gym work in the coffee shop whatever your position in the community is that you begin to bring people to your house who you typically go and hang out with typically you don't bring them to church maybe because you already invited them they don't want to come to church and it's fine you bring them to your house we play this alpha course there and you create that fellowship for just two and a half months and in those two and a half months you believe for the most impact you don't have to mentor them you're just simply there to facilitate the conversation you don't have to be a member of our church to do it it can be men and women it could be just men or just women it could be in Spanish it could be in English and you don't have to do it all year long it's just two and a half months we cannot pray for a vision globally without doing something locally and I'm praying for that today 
we've been praying for over the last two months for God to begin to raise up people in our church you can do it in other cities you don't have to be in Tri-Cities to do that you can do it over Skype you can do it over internet and I ask you today church that you pray about becoming a host this coming fall you may say me I came for the first time in church today you yes <laughs> me but I am not even saved just a few minutes I'll give you that opportunity <laughs> me but I, I, I don't know much about Bible you don't have to know much you just really have to have a place where you can bring four to five people and next month we'll kind of each service will give you little tips on how you can do that I believe every person should do that in our church in next two months in those months from September till Thanksgiving we're gonna see the greatest harvest of souls being impacted through this vision Amen. guys I believe in this so much that you know it was my birthday yesterday and during uh, birthday I received gifts and I'm thankful uh, to God for wonderful generous people who bless me but last week in the beginning of last week I felt in my heart that um, because of this vision that we have for the fall our internship is doing so good people are being impacted right now uh, through social media uh, through different venues power evangelism but I don't want this to stop when fall hits when the fall comes I want this to go to another level and the Lord kind of placed on my heart and he said Vlad I want you you know this this week on your birthday to do something that you haven't done before you know some of you know my goal each year is to give one car away and I've done that this year you know we emptied me and my wife we emptied the accounts and just uh, blessed a wonderful person from our church with the car and stuff so and the Lord said you know what place I felt this just in my heart for this vision I want you on your birthday give another car away I was like God well if you give me the money I'll get you the car <laughs> and stuff so, and I gave that decision I said Lord I'm gonna do that the first time God provided for someone in the Bible he wasn't provided for his bills he provided for his sacrifice you know and God blessed me with that yesterday and today I'm gonna bless one person with a car in the church partially because I've been praying for this and I've noticed this person faithfully um, who came to our church God delivered this person and this person now is working it's part of our internship and this person is currently um, going through some things they got a job they have a license but if you have a license you need a car correct it's our dream to have every person in our church own a car and own a home <laughs> amen this is not this is not for the show um, I don't do this stuff for the show it's before God and secondly um, because it's my birthday I have the right to bend the rules just a little bit because <laughs> typically we don't allow people personally to give to people but I hold the microphone so today I'm gonna make the inception and so um, and Ella we're gonna bless you with the car God bless you. Welcome to Tri Cities. Welcome to Hungry Generation. Unfortunately, we can't do that to everyone. We will one day when everybody else starts to picking up on this habit of giving more on their birthdays than just receiving but but we'll get to that but I believe guys in uh in the fall as even I took this sacrifice I believe that you will take a step of faith and simply say Lord use me in this fall to impact a few people around me for two months I'm not asking for three years I'm not asking for a lifetime commitment I'm asking for second or second week of September until Thanksgiving that you just give God a shot and say Lord it's awesome what you're doing through power evangelism but God you can use me you can use me